The meeting is called to order at 6.31 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I please have a motion and a second that the board approves the September 19th, 2023 agenda as submitted? So moved. Second. Board members, questions, comments? Okay, all those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Can I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Board members, questions, comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Okay, can I please have a motion and a second that the treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund re revenue status report, general fund budget status report, school lunch fund cash report, and school lunch fund revenue and expense budget report for the month ending July 31st, 2023 be approved. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. All right, special reports. We have two um incredible special reports this evening. First will be our summer programs update from our directors and then followed by our summer facilities update. You may recall that Mr. English, our, our uh, director of facilities, does this annually to talk about what we did over the summer. So this special report theme really is what do all those adults do all summer long? Um, so I think are all the directors coming up together? All right, so you'll need to bring a couple more chairs up, but we have the uh, director dream team here. We have uh, Sheena Conway, our director of humanities, Jason DeLorenz, our uh, director of technology, Scott Dressler, our director of special education and PPS. We have Kim Gebhardt, our new director of STEAM, and we have Kevin Marriott, also our new director of professional learning as his title went from assistant director to director. So I will, uh, you guys have a clicker and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm hoping this works and I don't know if we can also lean, but I'm gonna leave this over here for the people that are far <laughs> away from the table. If they okay, perfect. I'll move forward a little bit. My name is Scott Dreschler. One of the running jokes that, that I have is as I transition to my ninth year, I think I've started the presentation at this presentation. We're very honored to be able to share the great work that occurs over the summer with the Department of Instruction, the Office of Instruction, and the Office of Equity and Access. So with that said, in the world of what we're gonna be living in here today, is there are summer programs that we all help support throughout the year. It's the extended school year program that I worked primarily with, the elementary math and reading camps that our Director of Humanities and STEAM helps support, other curriculum projects, um, professional learning, and our technology teams throughout the summer. In my role as the Director of Special Education and, and Pupil Personnel Services is that we support students through the Committee on Special Education process um, that qualify for extended school year. That runs for six weeks, and that was from July 10th through August 18th, Monday through Friday. There's two programs within that umbrella of extended school year. Program A, which helps support our special classes, that's our K through 12, 12 one ones, and our K through 12, 12 one three ones. And then we also have program B that we refer to, which is a reading and math supported special class in a small group setting. Um, I was the overseeing administrator. Um, it was great. It was my first year as that person that was closely connected to extended school year. So that was phenomenal to be close to the students during the summertime. It's definitely a different vibe in the buildings. 
um, or in the building. And then Jen Malik was our extended school year coordinator, and she did a phenomenal job with the planning and help supporting the day to day. We had an intern as well, an admin intern, um, Letitia um, Colvett, who was a Cobbles librarian, who was very um, great with all the students and supporting them. It was new as she's a librarian. So in the world of special education, supporting students with varying abilities, it was a great learning experience for her. So the program itself really is based off of that Committee on Special Education decision that a child qualifies for summer programming based on regression. So it's a core academic subject based on the data that we have throughout the school year that IEP coordinators and related service providers collect that they present to the committee that shows that when a child comes back from an extended leave, it requi they require additional time to catch up and fill the gaps to where they were prior to leaving for that time. We had a staff of 30 teachers and service providers, and we supported around 130 students kindergarten through 12th grade. So a little more in depth around the different programs. 1211 is our regions based pathway. Uh, 12131 is our alternate based pathway. Those pathways are supported through a special class. That date mirrors that of a typical day. It's an abbreviated version of that day. It's about four hours, but they focus on, again, those core subjects, primarily reading and math, because that's where we collect a lot of that data. And reading and math, again, cross over and they infuse into multiple subject areas. Program B, we'll refer to as that related service. It encompasses the speech and language, the occupational therapy, the physical therapy, but it also helps address the reading areas of need and math areas of need, delivered in a small group setting. We share the progress reports from the individual providers. They get shared out as the school year starts with the receiving teacher this September. So a student left in June, they go to a new teacher throughout the summer in our extended school year program, and then they go to another new teacher in the fall. We want to ensure that the communication and that regression and the ability to maintain skills over the summer is communicated to the receiving provider as well. Yes. Thank you. All right, so we had our annual summer camps uh, hosted at Harrisville this summer, and um, it was for both reading and math. And so students qualifying for this program, they exit grades K through four. Um, teachers from all elementary buildings and across all grade levels instruct this camp, so we're very fortunate to have our own staff instructing the camp because they're familiar with our programs and our intervention tools. Um, as I mentioned, camp was held at Harris Hill and it consisted of two 75-minute sessions to allow students to attend both math and reading. So those sessions run concurrently, so if you need math um, for one session, you can attend reading in the next session. And students are invited based on data. Um, this performance data is analyzed through September to March. Um, obviously, teacher recommendations are really important, but we also look at data from our nationally normed screeners, our progress monitoring tools, and then our common ELA and math assessments. So for elementary reading camp, we had 109 students invited this summer. Um, and those are students are organized in small groups and by grade level. Uh, and depending on what they need, the sessions focus on uh, a number of important reading skills from phonemic awareness. So this phonemic awareness is all auditory. That's the student's ability to manipulate sounds. Um, phonics, so that letter sound recognition, decoding and encoding, that's that spelling piece. Uh, fluency is something that we also focus on with students, so that's that accuracy and rate and expression at which they read, and so we know that if students can read fluently, then they can comprehend what they're reading, and so reading comprehension is also an important skill that we focus on, as is vocabulary and background knowledge. The numbers tend to be a bit higher for our primary oh. grades. We just <laughs> got, we just got, um, the Wizard of Oz told you to pick up the handheld mic. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yeah. So um, at the K-2, the primary levels, um, our numbers tend to be higher because we're trying to shore up those foundational skills and it's important that students are, are pretty much learning how to read by second grade. <laughs> and then on the elementary math side of things, we had 68 students attend in small group organized by grade level. Sessions consisted of practice with number sense, fluency, and problem solving. One highlight was when I stopped in we got to see uh, students in fifth grade. They were planning and building the, um, they made raised garden beds, and so they did everything along the lines of what's the cost, what's the area of perimeter, things like that. So it was a really uh, neat thing that they were able to see it come through, and we now have the gardens, which 
the adhere seal. So next we'll move on to curriculum development for the humanities. Um, it was a lighter summer in terms of the projects that were happening this summer just due to some transitions in the Office of Curriculum Instruction, but still really good projects taking place. You'll see there 22 projects occurred, um, over a thousand hours of work, and 80 teachers participated. So um, we'll start with elementary, and these are this is not a comprehensive list. This is really just highlights of, of some of the more notable projects. Uh, K-2 assessments were revised, uh, and emphasis was placed on spelling instruction and differentiation. So last year, our K-5 teachers engaged in a book study called Brain Words. This is a book that was authored by the gentleman that um, created our spelling program, Spelling Connections. And there's a real emphasis on spelling instruction being so critical for literacy instruction. It often gets pushed to the side, but the reality is it should be a key component of our instruction. So this was actually incorporated into our assessments and instruction going forward for K-2. We also updated our K-5 pacing calendars and eDoctrina assessments. We do this every summer. It's so important. We're constantly modifying and adjusting. And eDoctrina is basically the warehouse where we store our assessments to then pull data to be able to talk about it in a streamlined way um, at Data Days. We also developed K-5 curriculum. This is a really exciting project that happened this summer, and I, I wanted to highlight this especially. A K-5 reading curriculum based on IMSC's Orton-Gillingham methodology. So IMSC stands for the Institute of Multisensory Education. This work was led by our K-12 reading department chair and our K-12 humanities TOSA. So it's really the first time that Penfield have, has a core primary intervention tool that they're using across all of the buildings now so it's really going to help us not only be able to move groups with students so students aren't getting confused by different programs that are being used by different interventionists but it's also going to help us during data days be able to talk about data in a really consistent way because we're using the same assessment protocols so it's really exciting work um, that i'm looking forward to seeing the results of and then um, lastly for elementary, uh, our K-5 ELA assessments were modified by our NL teachers. Every summer, the feedback is <coughs> our K-5 assessments are not always accessible to our English language learners. And with the influx of English language learners that we've had over the past few years, this work is really of primary importance. So we made sure that we budgeted for it and they did great work around, around this. In the secondary world, there were some great projects that happened as well. Um, we revised our 712 World Language <coughs> Curriculum Map. So those New York State World Language Standards, they were launched in 2021. Uh, we were ahead of it, already doing work before that. They finally are here, and they're affecting our Checkpoint A courses. So our seventh grade teachers are already teaching to these standards, and then our high school teachers are preparing, and they're already teaching to these standards as well, and, and curating authentic resources, which is a big push with these standards. We have a new course running here at the high school. So we have pre-AP English two taking place in 10th grade. So we had three teachers attend the AP training in June and then wrote the curriculum this summer. And I should mention they were working all year preparing for this with release days as well, just to make sure they were familiar with that course guide and framework. So that's really exciting, the new course for our students that a number of students are enrolled in. And then lastly, our social studies teachers here at the high school, our global and AP world teachers are um, continuing to revise their curriculum. Those are two-year courses, both global one and two, and then AP world is a two-year course. So just continuing with that vertical integration, and they're also taking a look at more equitable grading practices. So standards-based grading, that's a big push in our district, and they wanna see how they can make that work in their, in their content area. All right, so I'm here to talk about the STEAM side of the curriculum, but before I do so, I just wanna thank the board. Uh, this is, I was driving in and this is my second month in the, in the position, and as you can see, we had 27 offerings, 1,288 hours, and over 90 teachers participating in the curriculum part of things, and I, in these last two months, I've been just very uh, inspired by the teachers that I get to work with now and the best part of it and the most selfish part about all of this that I keep telling everyone is the work that we're doing gets to impact my own children as a community member and that to me is one of the coolest parts about this new position that I get to work with um, knowing that they will impact my own children so that was that was my aha moment as I was driving in thinking <laughs> this is some really neat work that we we have in place and that we're working on throughout the years to come so 
One of the biggest things that I wanted to highlight is that in all of the STEAM areas, they have, within the, the next two years or the previous two years, we have seen new standards. And these new standards are, for some courses, have never existed, but also in other courses haven't been changed since 1996. The fine arts and the science standards haven't changed since then. So uh, this was a great opportunity this summer to look into how we can uh, realign, differentiate, create assessments, all utilizing those new standards. So that was a big focus this year. I just wanted to highlight some of the things in each of our areas of STEAM art. We have a new uh, class called Advanced Game Design. Typically it was in the same class and now we're looking to push it out into two classes because of the popularity of that. K-5 is looking at shared art kits, so similar to what science has, so that we can share similar art pieces throughout the district and keep that common, assess common alignment going on. CTE has a middle school entrepreneurship curriculum that we're working on realigning, redefining. Math, we uh, revamped the financial math curriculum. This is something that the state is talking about making a graduation requirement, so we were really working on how can we make that, uh, that program more aligned to what the state may be looking for. Embedding thinking classroom strategies. This is a new thing that um, our high school teachers have read a book on about building thinking classrooms and we're looking to expand that to other grades. But the idea that when a student walks into our math classroom, how can we focus, or how can we set the expectation that they're in the room and they're gonna be the ones thinking and it's not just the teacher delivering the instruction. And then updating our curriculum maps. Like I said, in math is another one where the standards are changing and are gonna be changing in the next couple of years, so how can we realign those standards to help impact, or help make sure we're ready for the next gen standards. In music, uh, we have a new elective in the middle school that I can't wait to check out called the Guitar and Ukulele Elective, which I'm really excited to see. And then again, we're updating the curriculum maps. We had a lot of new music teachers come into our district, so making sure that they feel supported was a big goal of ours this, this summer. And then lastly, science, we have Steam Tosa who has really made sure that our, we are ready to go with the, our investigations. So the investigations are eight labs that we are requi required to do, grades three through eight. And in order for uh, our students to be able to take the new science test in fifth grade and eighth grade, they have to have those four labs by fifth grade, the four labs by eighth grade. So we've been working on making sure teachers feel supported and making sure teachers feel ready to give those investigations, which again is new coming from the state. We looked at resources that we're getting through science and, and determining whether or not we wanna keep some, add some, so that was a big discussion about what resources we wanna look at. And then like I said, preparing science is another one, like I said, that has new standards that are coming out and have come out, so how can we support those teachers to make sure they're ready for that curriculum was a big, big, job to do this summer and will be in the following summers. Well, this is some pretty impressive work so far, team. Nice job. Um, and uh, thank you, like Kim said, to the board for welcoming us here. Thank you as well to uh, Senior Cabinet. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to sharing some of these updates. Um, I'm also excited because as we were editing this the other day, I have um, upgraded to two slides, um, which goes to show um, all the things that we are um, providing for our faculty and staff and that I'm excited to share with you now. Um, the first thing that I'd like to share is our new faculty orientation. We hit another record of um, new hires and uh, educators that we onboarded, mental health staff, um, a lot of teachers, special education teachers, um, and we listened to the feedback from last year and some of the biggest things were to um, incorporate more times for those relational practices that we believe so much in our district. So what we did consequently was create a time every day for each building to be together with all the new hires and just connect, to have the time to express how they're feeling, what are their concerns, what are they excited about. And uh, I was not surprised, but very excited that at the end of our new faculty orientation this year, that was one of the things that was most favorable. Um, people were excited to connect with each other um, and to establish those relationships so early on so that they could be successful going into their buildings and have those connections. Something else too that we added to our new faculty orientation this year was increased opportunities for our mental health staff 
to connect with um, existing members and veteran um, educators, mental health, health uh, staff members within the district already, and make sure that they had go-tos and people to go to and ask a question um, from the day that they set foot inside their building. So um, it was a really successful um, year, and I, I look forward to supporting our new faculty because we have our monthly meetings um, where we continue to listen to their feedback. We continue to provide them with ongoing learning and support and make sure that um, they want to be here and make sure that um, we're responsive to their needs so that they can show up as their best selves for the kids. Something else, too, that we created this summer was new administrator orientation. This is the first time we've ever done something like this. We had nine new administrators to their roles, um, excluding our senior cabinet. There are 25 administrators total in the district, so nine out of 25 is a considerable number. But it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to connect, to provide those, um, those areas of growth, too, and almost reset, not even just for our new hires, but as an entire team. So we had various opportunities throughout the summer um, that uh, not only our new administrators uh, engaged in, but also a lot of our veteran uh, administrators. For example, um, therapeutic crisis intervention, um, CSE chairperson, restorative practices, evaluations, special education. Um, and I've been hearing from our new administrators that they're feeling really, really supported throughout this process. In addition, we created a system called the Admin Ally Program in which we have paired up our new administrators with veteran administrators on a monthly basis to meet to talk about their goals, to make sure it's grounding into our district priorities, and to make sure that their needs are being met in this process. But again, that, that Admin Ally Program grounds in the relational practices that I know our district believes in so much as we make that welcoming and affirming environment. In addition, we held our leadership retreat, um, which was also met with some great success. Um, we added a third day. Um, last year there were two days, but the third day was really time for our teams to process together, to ask questions, to look at the steps of what's next. Um, the main foci of our leadership retreat was trauma-informed practices, but we also dug in significantly to the new New York State documentation for uh, supporting and affirming transgender and gender expansive students. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to all of our teams, but I know especially our high school team. I recently spoke with Leanna Watt, our principal, and um, there are many things that this documentation um, suggests and provides guidelines towards that the high school is already taking those steps and implementing. Um, so I'm very proud of that, but this is ongoing. Right? This isn't just a checklist where we say, we did this because the state did it. We need to continuously strive to be better. Um, and I see that, and I'm glad that we added that third day of our leadership retreat because it gives the time for processing, for planning, and making sure we're doing what's best for kids. Some other things that we've also um, had throughout the summer um, are community building circles trainings. Um, last year was a huge part of um, some of the trainings that we did with our educators. We're continuing those, but this summer we've also expanded to the tier two and three, which is more about repairing and restoring relationships. It's about re-engaging students, um, and there's been a lot of need from what we've heard from feedback for these trainings, and I'm very proud to say that we have um, built the capacity within where we have people within Penfield, TAs, administrators, teachers, mental health specialists that are leading these trainings. We are training the trainers to be able to build from within because it makes for such a stronger system than just bringing in an outside organization and moving forward. Um, last but not least, I'd like to touch on um, some of the great work our co-teachers are doing. Really, I'm, I'm talking about all these things here, but they wouldn't be coming to life without all of our educators, and it really is a gift to be able to work with them and, 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 and push and make sure that we are um, questioning our practices and that we are doing what is rooted in research and what is best for our kids. Um, we have a lot of new co-teachers, special ed and ENL, for example. Um, and between May, we also in June and July and August onboarded and created systems to welcome all of them as new pairs if this is their first year teaching so that they feel successful and know the resources that are available to them and also the plans as well to support them throughout the year. Thank you. Jason. Good evening. 
Thank you for the uh, opportunity to present tonight, and also thank you for continuing to support technology in Penfield. Um, the support of the board and, and senior leadership does not go unnoticed and has allowed us to you know, implement high quality and secure technologies, as well as to continue to develop and retain the highly skilled and dedicated IT staff that we are so fortunate to have. So thank you all for that. Um, so I broke this down into a couple different categories. The first category is the technology department is unique in that we are part of the Office of Instruction, but we also have a high you know, operations side of things as well. right? So we spend a lot of time interfacing with really every other department in the entire district, every staff member, every department here. So first of all, we supported district summer operations. As you know, the district does not shut down in June and just magically restart in September. So there's no summers off. Technology services provided support to ESY and summer camp programs that were mentioned previously, the Altad Summer School, the fine folks at district office, the facilities team, food service, and other office staff that are here all summer, you know, keeping things going and getting us ready for September. We also helped the business office and the HR office support the transition to Envision, the new purchasing and payroll software. We supported professional learning, all of those things that Kevin was talking about, our instructional technology TOSA, Will Kaufman and myself, we conducted several workshops on the new challenges and opportunities uh, posed by ChatGPT and other AI tools. We conducted workshops, continued to conduct workshops on ParentSquare, Office 365, and Book Creator. And we also supported the facilities department. I don't want to take too much away from Mr. English. Um, <laughs> But there were a lot of projects this summer that Facilities was working on, and that did involve a tremendous amount of coordination between our two teams and also the contractors to ensure that anything that was removed from the rooms was put back in time for our instructional staff to return and the kids to return. And obviously, we've got ongoing capital projects that require our coordination with the Facilities Department and also SEI Design and the contractors as well to make sure that that all goes smoothly in the future. Um, in terms of the one-to-one -one project and laptops in general and, and computers, remember we have over 6,000 computers in the district. That's between staff and students, right? And so the IT staff has a lot to do in keeping those updated, replaced on a regular cycle, patched, secure, and, and functional in the way that we want them to be. So this begins you know, at the, the, the middle school and high school level with the collecting, the inventorying, and assessing the returned laptops from all eighth and 12th grade students. And then the preparation, assignment, and deployment of all new laptops to all of our sixth grade and ninth grade students. Um, we've got many techs that work on this. Andrew Fischera was one of the ones that took the lead on you know, the deployment and the preparation of those. We also deployed all new tablet computers to all our kindergarten classrooms to operate on a stations model. We took a look at um, you know, the laptops that we had deployed to the kindergartens. We worked with Dr. Potter and Scott, and we determined that that was not an appropriate space for those, that was not an appropriate device for those spaces. And so we pulled those back this summer, and we redeployed about six tablet computers that open in a restricted mode just in our kindergarten classrooms. And Corey Vercolin and Jimmy Frashera, they worked really hard to make those as user-friendly and as secure as possible for our kindergarten students. And that, I think it's been a win so far. I'm hearing good feedback from teachers. We also cleaned and updated all the first through fifth grade laptops. This entailed transporting big metal racks with wires all over them to every single elementary building this summer and working with our tremendous team of college interns, our help desk assistant, Kelsey Porter, our network technicians, Chris Souden, Kevin Parker, and this involved removing every computer from every cart in every elementary classroom, opening them up, updating them, cleaning them, ensuring the proper operations, and putting them back, and also ensuring that everything was where it was supposed to be. Um, and while we did that, we worked on a full inventory of all classroom technology assets district-wide just to make sure that we knew where everything was, where it should be, and we're all good there. And you know, Matt Thomas maintaining our, our web help desk inventory system is critical to that. Additionally, we performed a full computer update at district office. Um, we finished a project. We, we purchased these uh, devices about six months ago, but we hadn't had an opportunity when we felt like we could you know, disrupt the operations of district office for most of a morning to get in there and remove the old equipment and update their new equipment. So they have all new computers there as well. We, we 
were at our um, leadership retreat, and then you were able to sneak in at least then the administrators weren't there. So I thought it was good planning. It was <laughs> Thank you. It was very, tr very sneaky. <laughs> when the cat's away. <laughs> Um, so, and then um, on the security side of things, we um, worked with a private security consulting, uh, consulting firm, Zelvin Security, this year to conduct a full cybersecurity test that included external and internal penetration testing, as well as a full password cracking vulnerability assessment. Um, we have already implemented several of the recommendations from the, that assessment. Um, and are working on more. And you'll see some more of those coming down the line, including an update to our password requirements, our length and complexity requirements for our passwords in the district. Additionally, we've partnered with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, which is a federal agency, to do a cybersecurity assessment as well. And we took those recommendations into, um, into consideration as well. And our senior network technicians, Brandon Hall and Michael Dalala, have worked sort of tirelessly to examine all the vulnerabilities that were found. Um, a testament to their work is there weren't many obvious ones found, but you know, that's why we pay these companies and we work with the government and they come in and they tell us the, you know, the things that we might not have been looking for, or maybe some, some idiosyncrasies in some of the platforms that we use that we can address. Um, and we've also installed a dedicated intrusion detection server which is a fancy piece of equipment that sits up here, uh, upstairs at the high school, that actually allows us to inspect uh, web traffic at the packet level and detect um, malicious actions in real time and respond and isolate before a small problem becomes a huge problem. Um, and that's the goal. We also purchased and began the installation of all new network switches throughout the district. I had hoped that we'd been able to actually begin and finish that project this summer, but um, supply chains are still kind of fun in the world of technology, and we didn't get uh, a number of those switches until very late August, and so we need to accomplish that work over breaks. But we've replaced a few so far, and it's looking pretty promising there. Um, and additionally, we are moving all district computers, actually we moved all district computers to an entirely new cloud-based management system that allows us to push out updates more effectively and efficiently uh, to, like I said, all of the over 6,000 different endpoints in the district. Um, at this time, we are excited and looking forward to answering your questions. What was your name again? I'm Jason. I'm Jason DeLorenz, okay. Tech Director. Yeah, hi. hi. Can you talk a little bit more about the chat GBT, um, uh, like, how do you say it? GPT. Mm -hmm. I can't get yes. my tongue around that. Um, uh, the kinds of things that m maybe teachers are being equipped with, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning uh, short answer questions in an AP history class. How do I know, how does, as a teacher, how do I know that the kid wrote this as opposed to chat and, oh, yeah. It's certainly a challenge for our instructors, right? Um, the focus of the sessions that we ran this summer was that, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and, you know, as much as we might want to travel back 5, 10, 15, 50 years in the past, right, where technology was different and the challenges of being a teacher were different. The fact is the genie's out of the bottle and this is the world we live in right now. You know what I mean? And we can never put it back. And so the focus was on teaching with and not against the AI tools that are available to both staff and students. Um, and reminding staff that we don't, you're fighting a losing battle if you're always trying to be the authenticity police or if you're always trying to catch students um, using AI. It's, it's more of how do we use it to enhance our instruction and how do we use it um, to help provide students that foundation that they can build off of and provide authentic assessments that can't simply be entered into an online platform and generated that way. You know, and do I have all the answers? Absolutely not, right? Um, but I think, and that's why I wanted to, you know, the focus of our sessions, and Kevin, I don't know if you were in any of those, but we sat together as colleagues, right, and used our combined experience to look at the tools that are available and say, like, okay, how can we respond to this? How can we leverage this? And how can we all come out sort of stronger on the other side? And while I think it might be easier to some extent at the secondary level, um, 
because students already have maybe sort of a foundational understanding of some of the tools. I think of it like calculators, right? We learn how to add by hand and then we add in calculators. And I think it's a lot of the same thing in with AI is we do want our students learning those foundational writing skills, but once you get to secondary, is there an opportunity to say, here's some text that was generated by ChatGPT or another AI tool. Let's work independently or with uh, some partners and edit, revise, combine that with another text, um, use that to make it stronger, fact check it, you know, move forward independently. Because our students are going to go into a workforce where this technology is being used, yeah. right? And even educators are using this technology. Um, people are using it to generate presentations, to generate lesson plans, to generate um, first drafts of emails, letters, mm -hmm. um, all these sorts of things. And, and we just need to recognize that it's here and, and that's the world we live in now. And I don't know, it's a little <laughs> scary and it's a little challenging, but it's also like a little exciting, you know? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Mark? Uh, thank you all. I mean, uh, first off, you know, thank you for all the work and effort you've done and your staff, how much time you put in and all the output, all the you know, all the, that's all the things that come out of it. I mean, all that you've mentioned, it's just a, it really sets the stage for a successful year. Um, I've got a, a, a few questions, so I can stop if we have others. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to mention, I'm going to kind of go backwards. Uh, you talked about the professional learning on the tools like 365, Office, et cetera. And, I'm, and I've always been an advocate of that, and I'm glad we're doing it because, you know, and no matter, you know, Adults aren't always the best at picking up things, but if the if the teachers and the staff don't aren't competent and proficient at it, it's hard to it's hard to get the kids to be that way. So uh, that is part of professional development. I think that was you know very important because then we can lead with the kids. They need to know this. Like, like I say, technology is what these kids will be working with and exper exposed to. So I'm really glad to see that. Um, and you know we've talked in the past about leadership retreat in the past few meetings. So I, I again think that was very, I was very impressed by that when we went there for the breakfast. Uh, the um, the the question for the summer camps and the summer schools. You've, you've talked about how the feedback and you know how you assess this. I'm just kind of curious about how the the feedback from the parents, you know, how they felt about their kids going, you know, and they feel like they're worth their time. What are they, what are you get hearing back from the parents? I can speak to just what I actually see when I go into the summer camp classrooms. These are kids that are excited to be there. They don't feel like it's school. Um, mm -hmm. I know Nikki Heinsler, our summer camp coordinator, she does an excellent job making it feel like camp. Um, there's always a fun theme. This summer it was fun games and activities. Um, and years, there's been different themes in years past. Um, we t typically have parents that want their child to attend. We get a number of phone calls, actually, if a student doesn't qualify. We have parents that really want you know, to see if there's like a wait list or if there's any additional availability for students to attend. So we have parents that are very supportive of the program. They ask about it. Um, we start actually planning for it early in January just so we can make sure that we let parents know when the dates are for the camp and um, when they can expect to hear from us um, about if their student qualified or not. So yeah, we have a good turnout every summer because parents know that it's just, it helps with that summer learning regression and they want their kids to attend. Those are the main things I have. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I have a question and then sure. a comment. Um, my one question was around, I know that this probably doesn't always happen, but are there opportunities for um, the summer teacher to also be the receiving teacher in the fall? Does that make sense? So the summer camp teacher would be the the receiving September yeah so like I might tutor or mm -hmm. work with a kiddo in first grade that I would then be receiving in second grade that, that would be that would be ideal it doesn't always work that way because it depends on who's teaching okay, right. the camp so sometimes it's a literacy specialist sometimes it's a classroom teacher um, sometimes that's a, a, a nice coincidence if mm -hmm. that were to happen but that would be that would be tricky to plan for um, but I would see the benefit if yeah. we could do it 
the other piece I think to remember is that <clears throat> we have four elementary schools, yeah. but the camp it takes yeah. all kids from all four elementary schools. And then you might be a second grade teacher during the school year, but you're in summer camp might be doing more of the first grade work. So mm -hmm. ideally perfect. No, but yeah, I was just curious if it, yeah. you know, oh, even with extended question. school year. So with, yeah, kiddos, for our students I mean, with disabilities is we are planful also. So we have some, some teachers, depending on who applies, um, that are projected to move either from a consultant teacher role mm -hmm. into a special class. So it's a great opportunity in a, in a less stressful situation for the child to be able to meet and form that relationship yeah. over the summer. So we've done that mm -hmm. in the past historically. It's planful, but it is dependent on who applies, who applies. in which, yes, Absolutely. but it, we look at those opportunities. That's, awesome. That's a great idea. Yeah. So I just have a, do you have a question? I just have a long comment. <laughs> I mean, it's not too long. Well, I just have to say, like, first of all, like, as a board, as a district, I think we know that kids are our priority. And Scotty, I heard you say, like, it was really great for you to be in the classroom working with the kids. So I think that's important for us to recognize. We all do this because we care for kids and we want what's best for them. And I heard, like, Shana, you say, like, everything you talked about that you're doing in summer is all based on the science of reading. So we're doing the current research. I think that's phenomenal. But what really stood out to me is that all of you are standing up there. And I really think what makes really good leaders are people that are willing to form strong relationships with the people that they work with. And I heard that over and over again, relationships. And I also heard communication. And I don't think any organization whether it's a school district or a business office is going to run well if we don't have strong relationships and we don't have communication so thank you for having those and building those and thank you for working together as a team so that we're not working in silos because if the right hand's not speaking to the left hand things just don't go well and i think that's i'm really proud to be a parent in penfield because you do what you do so incredibly well so thank you for all of your hard work thank, thank you, you. Thank too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I only said half of what was on my paper. <laughs> oh, okay. Well. So thank you guys for coming and just you know giving us details about what you've done, the extensive work that you guys have done over the summer. Um, I do have a question, and it's really not for you guys. Um, so the summer program, I just thought about it. How awesome would it be if we expanded it and gave more kids opportunities? Two yeah, so there's part, two pieces. Oh, yeah. One, as Mr. Drescher <laughs> talked about, is the extended school year, which yeah. is connected to a child's um, IEP, whereas our summer camp is, is really around students, um, um, you know, not, not necessarily with an IEP and not required, so it is, uh, you know, parents um, selecting to do it if they're invited. <clears throat> More is wonderful. Uh, I would just say we will absolutely look at that. I don't think there'd be anyone complaining. It's just around staffing it. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, one of the wonderful things in education is that summer. And so there are some teachers who love working through the summer and there are some who would like their summer off. And I'll be one to tell you that every year I taught, I had my summer off because I needed the two months to prepare myself <laughs> for September. So I think that's one of those pieces is making sure the staffing is there. Uh -huh. But it's something we can absolutely continue to, to look and build out. And then we had the opportunity to participate in a circle with Kevin. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm. I think that really gave us an understanding of what you guys can do with staff and with students. Um, and that's huge. <laughs> And then Jason, if you ever need um, someone to intern, um, I have a nine-year-old who <laughs> told me today that she had to fix her own computer. So if you ever need anyone, just let me, <laughs> let me know. We'll do. I, I'll tell you, I think it's such a, a good comment, but really honest because any classroom teacher can tell you that if they don't know what to do with the smart board, oh, yeah. ask the kid, mm -hmm. and I don't care what grade level it is. There's yeah. someone in that class who will step right up and, yeah. and fix it. So uh -huh. um, it really is amazing. And you know, years ago, um, there's a lot of dialogue around like the digitive, uh, digital natives uh, versus digital immigrants. And like our kids, all of these students currently in, they're, they're digital natives. Mm -hmm. they, they grew up with it, they know it, they can see it. I can attest that I have a five-year-old who can unlock anybody's iPhone and figure <laughs> it out and and you know it's really a, amazing and so it goes back to what Jason was talking about around like chat GBT and 
we can block it the best we can, but I, I want to talk about that because we blocked it originally when it really started, and, and all that really does is become an equity issue because you wouldn't be able to access it from your school computer, but you could access it from your cell phone because we can't block cell phones. It's mm -hmm. illegal for us to, to, to try to filter a, a personal device on a guest network or, sorry, on the, um, on the wireless. And so that's, that's that piece that's just so important is our students really are involved in it. And then you look at now what those jobs are that aren't even real. They're not existing jobs that our elementary schools could very well be working when they graduate many years from now. Um, and so pretending that we don't need to worry about it um, and we just want to take it all, all technology away and go back old school isn't really preparing our students either for what's what's out there so it's a I Jason gets a lot of credit for the um, amount of, uh, of background work so you're not always out front but anything happening tech wise uh, Jason is uh, tuned in you can't see it but he has like a port in the back of his head I think that <laughs> goes right into the network so but it really is it's, it's a tremendous amount of work because we are we are a school but we're also a a very large employer with 6,000 computers uh, out there and a, a lot can go wrong if we don't have the right people monitoring keeping an eye on it so thank you I just have um, a couple comments and questions so first comment is um, I'm really appreciative of each and every one of you and all that you've done and welcome Kim thank to you. P-Town. <laughs> um, uh, and everybody thinks that during summer we all float around in the swimming pool <laughs> and we do no work. Um, actually, I do that. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you for showing up every day during the summer and I hope you each had time off to rest and restore and take care of yourselves so you too can come back and do this amazing work that you show up and do every day. So thank you for that. Um, Technology-wise, I really appreciate all the technology that our students are learning and they have access to because, let me tell you, I just take it to my children and I'm like, fix it, make it work, you know, and, and it's amazing what they can do. Um, my 13, my now 13-year-old was taking selfies at one, one-year-old. She grew up with the iPhone, so, you know, it's very interesting. Um, and then my last, I have a question about equity and summer camps. Do our urban to suburban kiddos have access to this? So this has come up um, in busing is an issue. Um, okay. And so we have discussed this with Dr. Potter and Dr. Maloney and how we can make this camp accessible to them. I know last summer we were able to provide busing to our students, but that still didn't extend to our um, urban suburban students, um, which okay. was unfortunate. So that is something that I think that we should explore and that we should continue to look into and how we can make, how we can bring our urban suburban students in. Um, but unfortunately, historically, it hasn't always worked okay. out unless they can get transportation. So transportation is the issue. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And so for this year, we did not transport to summer camps. So last year we were able to with some funding, but it runs into the same piece with staff, just like we need teachers to teach it, we need drivers who wanna come in in the summer. One of the perks of being a driver is summer's off, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that is also a piece in terms of how we can make that happen. Okay. And this year, um, the high school summer school was not in Penfield, so that's, uh, it, trying, we tried so hard to coordinate and weren't able to make it work for elementary so that camp. when high when summer school which is regional is at a different school then we do bus our high school students from the high school to mm -hmm. there they have to they have to get to penfield yeah. high school but then the bus takes them to wherever the summer uh school is because it's regional mm -hmm. and um and so that any of the buses we have that's going to be the first priority sure i understand right. that yep. definitely um your question though just gave me an idea that mm -hmm. i hadn't thought of before that I'd like to talk with Dr. Potter and, and the directors. The board about. members can drive buses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not any, no. Paid training. Mm -hmm. Same. Same. Yeah. All right. Um, but and I'm, I, I want to hear that idea as well. Um, so one more question for you, Sheena. When so we know that who needs the support at summer camp, right? Um, because of the data that we aggregate and, and figure out. So do some 
because of transportation is issues, do some folks, some families decline because they can't get the transportation? Is yes, that it? Yes, that is an issue for some families that, you know, they work, they can't make it happen. Um, we've run into this issue where we've tried our best where a student really needs it and qualifies and so we have our you know reading teachers try to compile resources for them to bring home with them over the summer to help okay. with that regression but it does happen because it does put um, a hardship on the family if they can't get here for yeah. transportation. So yeah. it's definitely something that we need to, to sort of work through I think to make yeah. it open. Because we want to make students. this equitable. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know yep. everybody who needs it should be able to receive it. Absolutely. And it's our job to remove the barriers yeah. and make sure that it happens for our students, mm -hmm. right? So, okay. so just to piggyback on that, so an urban suburban parent would get that letter saying, you know, Johnny, we really think Johnny would benefit by math camp, but that, so they would get that same letter or communication as everybody oh, else, yes. Yes. but then it's just they're predicated on transportation. If they they might decline because exactly. of transportation, yeah. yeah. All right, just as I'm really good because I have smart people like Dr. Potter whispering, the, uh, I'll, but I'll say it out loud, which is the <laughs> same example is true for a student who happens to live in Penfield. Right. Yes. So yes. it's, it's yeah, the yeah. transportation is, and yeah. it's one of those pieces where as we look at, you know, our budget and our, and all that we do, this is an ad. We're not required to have a summer camp. It's not anything like that. It's something Penfield does to try to continue building, um, but it's not perfect because of that transportation piece. So we can absolutely take that those, that feedback from the board and dig in for the for the next year. Self-driving cars. Self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're getting yeah, there. Exactly. Drones delivering kids. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll drive a bus. I'll do it. Like put me on the bus. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. So thank just you. Uh, thank you to the directors. Thank you very very much thank for coming you. out tonight. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But wait, there's more. I have uh, Mr. George English, our Director of Facilities, who will be our second special report uh, around summer work uh, for the Facilities Department. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I do, let's see, get to the right slide. That's me. Wonderful. All right. So just <coughs> quick Facilities Department uh, updates from our summer projects. And then uh, a quick update on staffing. And then, as always, I have superstars to recognize. Mm -hmm. And they are super. So um, <clears throat> at the high school, we installed new uh, safety netting on the north and south ends of the turf field. That was desperately needed. Uh, it was a bit embarrassing, actually, the condition of the uh, posts and netting. So that looks a lot nicer. Uh, we added additional pavement and striping to the b uh, bus pickup on the I said east side, I think it's southeast side of the building, and that's working wonderful. Um, we're able to uh, avoid having buses go all the way around back yeah. behind the building now, so that's great. Uh, we added pavement uh, for a storage container uh, near door 30. That was by door 17 last year. We didn't like it out there. Everybody had to see it. Uh, we stored the security vehicle in that and a 75-foot uh, boom lift. Uh, we also restriped the tennis court lot and added numbers for junior parking and connected the sidewalk right outside the pool entrance and the <coughs> sidewalk over by the tennis courts. So it makes that area safer as well. And then uh, we did have a little issue with the tennis court that we resurfaced last year, but uh, the company came back and uh, fixed that, and so we got that done this summer as well. Uh, uh, replaced wall matting that was damaged in the east and west gyms. Um, we assembled a lot of tables and chairs, uh, and that's uh, that was a lot on our custodial staff. Uh, we abated asbestos flooring from our art wing, A2 through A6, and ended up installing epoxy flooring. We were going to just do um, grind the concrete and polish it, but uh, the condition was not suitable for that after we remove the tile. I have a few pictures that I'll show you. Okay. We uh, completed D7. We started that last summer and then did the uh, administrator and receptionist office and then cleaned windows, which I put that on everything because that's a big deal. Yeah. We spend 
almost twenty thousand dollars every year cleaning windows it's it's expensive but it's it's needed and necessary so uh, the picture on the far left is some matting that was tore up and not looking you know the way we want to present our gymnasiums and then the picture on the far right is what it looked like af afterwards the picture in the middle with a beautiful blue sky uh, <laughs> is the netting that's uh, on the south end now of the uh, field and we expanded that a little bit more than it was before so that people can actually park in the tennis court parking lot and not worry about lacrosse balls going through their uh, headlights and taillights. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then this is uh, the picture on the left is the flooring in uh, actually room A2. Uh, picture in the right is what it looked like afterwards. And that's uh, after the second time I had to make the contractor come back and redo the flooring. That added to my stress this summer because it was tight schedule wise. <laughs> And then we added another week because they had to redo it. But uh, it came out awesome. Looks fantastic. Very happy. It does look good. And then this is uh, the floor, uh, picture on the left is uh, room A4, or excuse me, A5. And that, that concrete floor had a lot of fiber in it. We had mm -hmm. no idea that they put fiber in concrete to reinforce it. That does not lend itself well to being ground and polished. So. Mm -hmm. Again, that came out fantastic after the second try. <laughs> Bay Trail, uh, we moved science room from uh, room 127, which is down near the uh, gymnasium, to 205. So all the science rooms are now clustered together. Mm -hmm. uh, we remodeled room 127 <coughs> to accommodate computer training classroom. And we added an eyewash station to 205, which is necessary in a science room. <coughs> We painted the athletic hallway school colors so that when you come in, which the entrance is kind of, you know, in the back of the building and makes you feel like, am I in the right place? And then you, come, we, you would come in and you're like, ooh, I'm in the back somewhere. I have no idea where I am. There's a sign way down, <coughs> excuse me for my voice, uh, way down at the end of the hall. But it, it just didn't draw you towards the gym. Now I'm, I'm hoping it'll draw folks to the gym. And it looked, again, presents the image I want us to present. Um, again, we replaced some wall matting in, in the uh, Bay Trail gym. Uh, we replaced the sheet metal flooring for our uh, kitchen staff in the walk-in cooler. We added a beam, which was, you know, seems like whatever, but that was a big deal. <laughs> it's amazing how difficult it is to get outside contractors to do work. You know, I, I reached out to so many, got two quotes, now the, the company that came to do the work is who I would have wanted and they did an awesome job. But um, again, it, it's just, everything is so hard. It, you know, mm -hmm. people aren't looking for work. They got way more than they need. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, uh, again, we cleaned lots of windows, mm -hmm. uh, helped out the cook manager, hung various signage. Um, so there's the beam, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> painted, <laughs> wonderful, ready. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the, the walls that hopefully now draw you towards the gym. Uh, notice how beautiful the floor is. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, there's the uh, computer room that used to be a science room. Uh, we, we removed lots of different furniture and, and pieces. You can see where we, the, the guys patched the tile floors. Uh, they made it look almost like things were never there before that aren't there now so I was really happy with the job they did there. Uh, Scribner uh, we re refinished the gym floor uh, we remodeled the old computer room and removed countertop shelving build-ins and painted the entire room. Um, we replaced the door into the main office with a security window that sort of got done in the summer it was actually thankfully I didn't present the first uh, meeting of September uh, we didn't quite make it but uh, it is done now it was still it is summer the yeah, first it, day of summer exactly like week, actually so yes good. it was it yeah. was done before you can still say summer. <laughs> yes uh, so but that's working wonderfully now yeah. um, and, and you know very pleased with the the job the company did for us on that cleaned windows we did build a office for the cook manager the uh, Scribner cook manager was working basically in the kitchen and had no privacy as far as meeting with staff and so uh, the guys did a great job on that so there's one of our 
our head custodians uh, working on the gym floor at Scribner. The picture on the right is uh, the, the finished office. Um, and so that's really nice. And then that's the new secure entrance at Scribner. So Indian Landing, uh, we converted a bathroom to single occupancy. Uh, all gender bathroom we replaced uh, the rest of the stair treads we started that project actually that project was started before I even got here we did some more last year and now it's all of the stair treads have been updated um, we arranged uh, for additional lighting for a back parking lot so the back parking lot was going to be a temporary lot years ago it's permanent now and so as the days get shorter and less light, mm -hmm. it's hard to see coming and going. So um, the bases are supposed to be in this week. And so hopefully within the next couple of weeks, those lights will be installed. And so as we start losing light, we'll have a parking lot that people can see in. And again, we cleaned windows, which was a challenge. Um, our contractor uh, was great, worked with us, worked around our big capital project that was happening there this summer so and so there's the the new stair treads um, they, they just you know again present the image that we're trying to present cobbles uh, we milled and repaved and restriped the basketball courts um, there it's actually only one big pad but it, there's multiple two basketball courts <coughs> and then there's four square we added a window for the assistant principal's office and the principal's office, updated some of the hallway lighting to LED. Uh, we rearranged the new serving line, uh, which now is being used um, at Cobbles. Uh, added window blinds <coughs> to one of the old serving lines that's been discontinued because it was in disrepair. And so that area could be used for storage. And then uh, we replaced a countertop and uh, b backsplash in the faculty room. And there's the windows again. <laughs> so there's the serving line uh, uh, set up the way that, uh, um, that the current staff would like it to be done. And so it required a little plumbing and uh, a little bit of work by the guys, but uh, our guys did that internally. Uh, there's a new window. Um, and I'll get to this in a minute, but <coughs> one of our A-team members, who is Troy Thomas, he has a significant background working in, in windows. And so he is absolutely phenomenal at installing windows. Um, they, they always come out great. And so we're, you know, fortunate to have somebody internally that can do that work for us. I'll just, can you put that back, George? I just want to point on that is that, you know, it's a window in an office, so is it necessary? But but that both the principal and the assistant principal being able to be in the office and see right into the main foyer mm -hmm. so it really is not just for it's nice but it's that convenience but it's also the sort of security and and safety piece that while mm -hmm. in a meeting you can still see right out into the into the foyer mm -hmm. where all the kids are coming in or right. leaving at Cobble so yep. it, it's huge thank you yeah. welcome uh, Harris Hill we restriped restriped excuse me the parking lot uh, repaired a brick wall that's by the dumpster that uh, was just getting deteriorated. Uh, painted the principal's office, set up a new office for the assistant principal. Uh, again, cleaned some windows. Uh, added doors to the offices in HEC 16, which is uh, where the uh, special education department has some offices. Um, and when we originally did it, we didn't put uh, doors. We just made it so that it was, had double wall kind of thing that you had to walk through to get to it. And really, we only had one person who was permanently in there as an office. Uh, now we have two, and so they requested the doors, and so we were able to get that done. It's the doors are in, so they they're functional. Uh, we still have a little bit of finish work to do, but so that's what they look like the last time I was there. Th they'll be finished uh, on B shift here shortly. Uh, th I, they may actually even be painted, for all I know. But I haven't been over there this week. Um, so that that was really the updates as far as projects it was we actually took on quite a little bit internally and externally um, uh, but uh, I, you know very pleased with uh, what we were able to get done uh, staffing wise uh, every time I present this I'm in a better position um, and 
very grateful right now from a maintenance mechanic situation to only be too short. We, we have four new staff members um, and they're all doing very well. Uh, two of them, uh, you know, really needed to learn quite a lot. One of them was a cleaner and we brought him on. He had some experience working um, in apartments and, and whatnot. He's doing a great job. Um, we divided up the A team, which I'll give you a picture of in a minute. That's our two B ship guys, uh, Bill and Troy. Um, they, Troy is the happiest, most wonderful person to ever talk to, deal with, and he acts like he doesn't know as much as he knows. <laughs> Bill, who you know is really our B shift supervisor, him and Troy have been our A team for years. That they were assigned that before I started here, but. Um, Bill can do anything and do it. I mean, j carpentry, tile, carpet, just, I mean, he is phenomenal. Now, he runs his own little side business and does some of that too, which helps him improve his skills, which is fantastic. Um, but uh, we split up the A team this summer, and each of them took on one of our new employees and really focused on training them. Now, that school's back in session, the A team's back together. But so, <laughs> um, right now we have three and a half vacancies for cleaners. We have one applicant, which uh, we're trying to get set up an interview with. We have one vacancy for a head custodian, which that is a, a new <laughs> position. Um, all of our elementary schools except Scribner has had a head custodian. Uh, we shared the head custodian between Bay Trail and uh, Scribner. Uh, we had an employee that's been with the district for nearly 40 years retire, and so we were able to stay financially neutral because of the years of experience and what we were paying him. And we do have one applicant from the head custodian list who's applied. Um, we're unfortunately, if we do hire them, stealing from a neighboring <laughs> district, but too it's bad. Not Fairport. <laughs> can't help it. <laughs> So, so this we'll is, as goes. George references, this is civil service. So when we talk about the yes. list, uh, yeah. head custodian is a civil service. Civil so service. we can't just go out yeah, and hire. Yeah. We've got to follow the civil service process, and yeah. there's one person on the it's list. A, yeah, it's so. a competitive position. Yeah. So, yeah. so at, you know, r really, if we're able to fill a couple of more positions, we're going to be below 10% vacancy-wise, which is just fantastic. So mm -hmm. very, nice. very good news. And uh, so... One of the first superstars I'd like to recognize is Dave Pickard. I did recognize him when uh, we walked through um, Scribner and Bay Trail. Uh, he is really assigned to Bay Trail during the school year, but in the summer, he does everything. You know, he is the lead guy as far as scrubbing and waxing floors. And I don't know if you can tell in the picture, but he's sweating a bit. <laughs> Every time I go to that building in the summer, he's working so hard that he's sweating. I mean, it is unbelievable. And it was an especially awesome summer for him. Well, it was a little sad in that he lost his partner, Pat Gary. Pat and Dave were like an yeah. awesome team. Uh, they worked together all summer long. Pat would cover Scribner in the, during the school year, and Dave covered things at Bay Trail but he got to work with his daughter this year. So that's his daughter pictured there with him. Uh, she's in school at Nazareth, so she'll be back next summer. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was we're really hoping, cool to see so. him working together. But, but Dave is just fantastic. And again, Dave is like Troy in that. You ask Dave, uh, you know, I, anytime I say, Dave, could you help? Absolutely, boom, 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 done. And just with an awesome attitude, and it doesn't matter who asks him. It's, it's, he's just fantastic. So. I, Really appreciate him. And then there's the A-team. So <coughs> Troy is on your left and Bill is on your right. Bill is really Vasily, uh, but most people in the district know him as Bill. And again, uh, um, you know, they, we are able to do as many internal projects during the summer as we do because of those two and because of their abilities. So really appreciate them. So thank you for your time. Any questions? Board members, questions? I have a comment. Go ahead. 
So, George, I empathize with staffing shortages, trying to get good people to do, you know, jobs that people don't think of as an, how do you say that? I, we understand the importance right. of the work they do, and we embrace them. But like, how many people think in terms of how helpful they are mm -hmm. when they're doing work like that? Mm -hmm. And um, so I appreciate everyone's efforts, and I appreciate those who are here and stay with us. Yes, I, I think, me too. <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful, you know? And when you show that appreciation, then it becomes what we were talking about before with relationships and partnerships and, you know, just a well-run organization. <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my voice right now, but... Um, so anyway, I appreciate your efforts, and I wanted to Thank just you. extend that because it's hard, it, I, and I know it, and I think most of us do here too. Well, we, we're very fortunate. We have a lot of really super yep. people. Really well, we've super. met them, too, on our yep. tours. And the joy yep. Yep. and the um, interaction and the pride in their work and, um, you know, just, I don't know, there's a lot of love there. Yeah. It, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Anyone else? Have one question. Um, the beam that was installed in Bay Trail? Yes. What's it for? Oh, you I'm were so excited. I'm I was sorry. Hoping, <laughs> I was hoping to get a little bit it's more. It's for a mat hoist. <laughs> so we, we have oh. storage <laughs> problems everywhere in every okay. building. Okay. And, um, you know, we do a lot of cheerleading. Uh, um, we're, you know, and so we need mats that cover basically the entire gym when sure. we're doing that. Okay. And that's the primary storage that, that we'll be able to free up a storage area that's in okay. the corner and the, those Take mats will be up in the air. Okay. Yep. They roll them up mm -hmm. and then they get hoisted yep. mm -hmm. and it saves tons yep. of room, but it's not yep. easy. Yeah. Sorry for getting too excited. Oh, no worries. <laughs> like, I, I, I felt the excitement. I got excited too. I think too. the answer would be better if it's, is just a steel beam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it what was, is it for? Yeah. 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 Thank you, George. And George, thank you for all that you do. And I really do enjoy touring the buildings with you during the summer. And I missed Good. a couple this summer because I had to parent. Um, but I really appreciate when you take us around and you explain to us all of these projects. And because I toured some of the buildings with you and then to see the results here in your presentation mm -hmm. was really um, wonderful. Well, like it was, good. you know, completed, yeah, I, you completed the circuit for me. Our timing for the tours this year was really good. Yeah. Because, yep. you know, some of the projects were done and the ones that weren't, I at least able to let you know that we're trying to get them done. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. so yeah. thank you, George. Yeah, appreciate you. you. Anyone else? No? Well, thank you so nope, much. And just you. like thank what you, Krista said, it. you know, we were able to actually see all of the work that needed to be done over the summer, especially like Indian Landing. Yes. Um, but then to be Ooh. able to see it done, right, yeah. um, at the last Ooh, meeting, it was last. amazing. <laughs> that <one> was <laughs> yeah. a little stressful. <laughs> a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for all nope. you do. I would yes. just note to, to George is that all of those things, when you look at like what facilities took care of in the summer doesn't include all of the typical summer work which is well, the right. stripping That's and waxing and cleaning and moving and so it's just it really is and George mentioned a couple times like how you know he or how we want to to um, display ourselves right mm -hmm. and and that really is it's just like your house I think all the time but it's just a huge home which is if you <laughs> let it go to the point where it is completely done, then you've got to, you know, replace something entirely as opposed to all of these small things to keep it going. Um, <coughs> it's really amazing what they do. And I don't think people realize mm -hmm. the skill set of our B&G crew. Yeah. You know, when you take a look at their combined experience across all of their areas of specialty, it's really amazing. So yeah. thanks, George, for all you Thank do. You. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. That concludes special reports. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> so tonight we were going to get the opportunity to meet our student rep, Helen Broikos, is it? Mm -hmm. But she is homesick. Aww. So Helen, if you are watching, we just wish you a speedy recovery and we cannot wait to meet you. 
if you don't mind, Helen is so good that even though she's not here, she sent Kathleen oh, her awesome. minutes or notes. Wow. So awesome. I will not yeah. do her any justice, but I will at least just share. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. definitely. I have some serious. <laughs> I uh, met with Helen last uh, Friday just to kind of go over, introduce the process and such. And so the board knows in the community, I also tell every student rep when they start, like you are a student first. Mm -hmm. So if there is like an exam the next day or something you've got, like we all understand if you have to step away after your report, mm -hmm. just let, let me know or let the board member you happen to be sitting next to know. So, you know, we want to support you. Obviously it's our, our student. Um, but she uh, shared a couple district wide updates. It's homecoming week dress up days for all the schools yesterday was marvel day today was teen beach movie bikers versus surfers so mm -hmm. i gotta tell you there's at least one cobbles kindergartner dressed as a surfer um <laughs> friday is our football game against hilton but the fun starts at 5 30. it will include live music food trucks the family fun zone and then after the game for the first time fireworks here at the um backfield so come and stay i hope everybody uh, comes out uh, phs updates the school spirit is in full swing the hallways by the entrance are decked out in decorations team for uh, first robotics uh, rolling thunder had a kids night out with crafts games robots and more and ticket sales help benefit the team there were class meetings held in the auditorium, grade level meetings, rolling out the uh, new code of conduct. And uh, the students are excited. The commons is getting a makeover this year, our same as our baseball and softball fields. And um, very excited because there's an explanation point. Juniors can now park on campus. As George referenced, yeah. they added uh, spots. And where that came from was the, we had a long standing uh, partnership with the town where juniors could park at the community center and walk down. That's sort of an ongoing every year issue because there's only so many spots, but mm -hmm. then students would show up, the spots were filled, but what are they gonna do? So they'd illegally park. And so we worked through that. The reason why we could never have the students park in the community uh, tennis court lot, the tennis court lot, is because that's where we do our school bus driver training. So we actually are trainers of, our, of people who have never driven a bus before, and so you have to have a course to train. And the community center partnered with us, so we set up our bus training up at the community center so we could bring our students onto campus. And so it's not every junior there's a process because there's only so many spots but it, we're trying the best we can to help and then i do have to say that if you are outside of the walking distance there is a yellow limousine that comes to pick you up so if anybody says they need a parking spot we do provide door-to-door -door transportation on yellow school buses <laughs> um i have a junior that didn't go over well when i try that uh, ice cream social was held to welcome urban suburban students back to the school uh, for after the summer the first senior sunrise this is where they do the senior class goes out at early and watches the sunrise on the stadium uh, it was very well attended the many uh, clubs started girl up drama club yearbook club art club lots of sporting games and penfield is doing especially well in football and field hockey mm -hmm. Um, Bay Trail updates, picture day was today. Uh, every student showed up looking their best. Many clubs have kicked off there as well. Students who love to sing and perform will be happy to know that auditions for the Bay Trail Idol will be starting soon. Scribner had its annual fall festival last Friday. Lots of fun food and fall activities all around. Did the driffles go? No. Okay, all right. Sorry to put you committed. on the spot. You're good, you're good, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cobbles last Thursday was cobbles curriculum night I added just so you know that it's also their fun run fundraiser this week through their PTA and then Indian Landing uh, if you're out there if you're an Indian Landing student and you're watching please know that tomorrow's your picture day and then Wednesday the 27th is the first drama club welcome meeting because Indian Landing is one of our elementary schools that puts on a production every year and then Harris Hill You'll hear from me a little later with a photograph that kindergarten teacher Laura Swanson received a golden apple from News 8. And then yesterday was curriculum night for kindergarten in first grade and grades two through five will be tomorrow night. So wow. I did not do Helen justice, I'm sure. It would have been much better from her, but amazing that she did reach out yeah, and uh -huh. took the responsibility yes. and um, wanted to make sure we had her notes. That was 
precise for that. You have to introduce me. Oh. Superintendent's report. <laughs> yes, we do have a we do have a few <laughs> superintendent reports. I have some staff uh, honors, uh, some opening day comments, and then um, it says Dr. Driffle for PCSD updates, but it's actually me. So you get a lot of me tonight. So AP scholars, we uh, congratulations to 141 PHS students and uh, 2023 grads who were named as AP scholars based on their outstanding performance on the advanced placement exams last May. Uh, the NISMA Allstate, congratulations to PHS students Elliot Tyler and Miriam Turley who have been selected to participate in the prestigious and New York uh, SSMA, New York State School <coughs> Music Association. Association. Thank you, Nancy Bradstreet in the audience. Uh, the All-State Conference in December, and also congratulations to Avery Egger, who was selected as an alternate. That really uh, says a lot about, again, our incredible music program that starts uh, with Suzuki in first grade. The Golden Apple Award. Congratulations to Harris Hill Kindergarten teacher Laura Swanson on being named the winner of a News 8 Channel Golden Apple Award for being a great teacher. And so just wonderful. There's uh, some more pictures on our Facebook page as well. Um, just an incredible teacher. We have so many of them, but it's great to see those Golden Apples. Just a couple of opening day comments. Really, it was a great first day. Um, I got around all buildings. People are feeling... Um, like we're maybe getting back to normalcy after after uh, pandemic and masking and, and shifts and it really felt like a, a good start I think over overall. Um, so again, some amazing photos on our social media uh, from Nancy Bradstreet. Um, great, uh, great first couple of days. I've already forgotten that it was, I think, 112 degrees the first day of school, but um, you know we're we're back into some regular temperatures now. And then just a couple of updates for me. Uh, being in the beginning of the school year, I want to talk about district priorities, um, share superintendent updates, talk a little about our Penfield Equity Long Range Plan, and a slide on district-owned property and our solar eclipse plans. Sounds like a lot. I promise it's not. So. Just as a reminder, it's really a thank you to our school board and uh, our focus around our district priorities, our lens of the work that we do. And uh, these have been in place for the last two years and uh, through this year as well. And it's really aligned to the four principles of the culturally responsive and sustaining education framework from New York State. And our focus really falls around four priority areas, welcoming and affirming environments, high expectations and rigorous instruction, inclusive curriculum and assessments, and ongoing professional learning and support. You heard about some of these with our director presentations. And so, um, as well as I think when we talk about those welcoming, affirming environments, even the stuff that George English talks about, making sure that it's welcoming as, as uh, individuals and students come in. So um, really, everybody on Parent Square um, gets messages from me on a, on a routine basis. But I just want to share here, because if you're not a parent in the district, you don't get my Parent Square messages. But messages that are really uh, bigger than just our current students and families, I also put on to the superintendent page of our website. And so uh, September 5th, I sent out a, um, uh, an update around our new district code of conduct and support. And then on September 13th, I sent out a uh, communication around the district's equity long range plan. So if you're not a parent in the district and you're interested to see either of those documents, I encourage you to go to our website and go to departments and there's a superintendent's page and you can find uh, both of my letters and those documents that are there. And so the equity long range plan, I'm not gonna go through it. You can go and look at it. We've got some incredible feedback around it. This is really in, in being transparent. So as a public school district, we uh, strive to be transparent. 
There are times that uh, in the world we live in, individuals feel like there's not transparency because there are certain things we can't share, personnel matters we can't share. There's lots of legalities, um, and many individuals who join the board realize when they go to board training that there's lots of things the district can't just openly share. There's a process for it, and it's all because of legalities and making sure that we are, are meeting the letter of the law. But the equity long range plan is one of these areas of transparency. So this document really um, has, has been uh, uh, two years in the making. And so when we talk through this, it's two school years that the district had a diversity, equity, inclusion core team, and they used the New York State Culture Responsive Sustaining Education Framework, as well as policies on diversity, equity, inclusion to create a long range plan. It, uh, like all long range plans, it's, it's a living document. It, you know, it, it's not perfect, but it's really, this is where we're going and focusing in on how do we make sure that we support every student uh, who enters the halls and walls of our school district. And so the process over the last two years was setting equity goals, identifying quick win wins. We do a lot of incredible things that you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel for. So what are those smaller things we could implement? And then really analyzing and applying that culturally responsive uh, roadmap K-12 to our district. And then summarizing results on an equity self-assessment that was administered to the core DEI team members. So then um, that document really has been in process with lots of eyes on it, students, families, faculty, administrators, and really looking at strategies that um, will help us get where we want to get to over the next five years. And that really is making sure that every single kid has everything that they need to be successful academically, feel cared for, feel supported, feel part of our school district. And um, I've always said there's many students that feel that way the minute they walk into the door, but not all of them. And so how do we make sure students are required by law to be here? So it shouldn't be a punishment. It should be a place that they can call home, that they can be heard, that they can be seen, and that their um, internal uh, individual differences can really be something that can be celebrated and shared. And so I encourage folks to, to take a look at the equity long range plan. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. And it all ties around five collective commitments. And this is really, this work is, is around um, equity, but it's also around making sure that every one of our students reaches their full potential. So for some that will be heading off to college, to others it might be a trade school, military, right into the workforce. We really wanna make sure we are servicing our students for what they need. And so those five collective commitments create culturally sustaining environments that ensure all stakeholders feel safe, known, connected, and experience a se sense of belonging. I live in this weird world now as a superintendent, but also a father of two high schoolers and a kindergartner. When my high schoolers come home, me as a dad want to know what you learned, what work do you have, do you have homework, right? And how was your day? But with my kindergartner, the number one question is, did you have fun? Did you have fun? Did you have a good day? I'm not really worried about homework in kindergarten or where they're falling on, the, on, on their learning. It really is about did they feel safe in school? Did they feel connected? And we know that all the research will continue to show that when students feel a part of the system and feel connected to trusted adults, they can run through walls. They can do incredible things. And I think this, it's not out of the ordinary to say that if you're working for somebody, if you're wherever you do for work, if your employer doesn't support you, see you, want to build you up, it might not be a place you want to work for your whole career. And so our students have to be here and we really want to build that sense of belonging for every single student. We establish high expectations for achievement and personal growth for each member of the district community. I think about that because I did get a comment around the equity long range plan that you know, stop focusing on equity, just focus on academics. You listen to the directors tonight, the community listen to the directors. All of that is focused on academics. All of it is building curriculum, tied to the standards, making sure that our assessments are tied to the standards. So this is not an or, this is not you're gonna work on equity or you're gonna do academics, it's an and. And we can do both because we are a district large enough and strong enough to, to work through this. And so uh, the collective commitment number three is use culturally sustaining research-based practices for designing and delivering best practices. This, is, this has been something that has been said to me since I started teaching, research-based strategies. So we've got great teachers doing great things, but 
we should be using the best research-based practices. Um, Dr. Maloney has talked before around the science of reading, using brain research on how we're teaching students, not just doing it the way we've done it because that's how we've always done it. And that really using that, that research-based, culturally sustaining practices is, uh, really helps build students and um, help them reach their full potential academically. Develop authentic and inclusive partnerships with our diverse students, families, faculty, and community partners. It's an area we have to continue working on, and I'm going to actually call out something that I feel uh, bad for, but last Friday was a Jewish holiday. It was also the Scribner Fall Festival, which was a PTA um, event, and I took a phone call, and all I can say is you're 100% right. We need to do better. So within our school district, we've tried really hard for school-based events to not fall on um, religious holidays or religious celebrations. But it's an area that at our first PAB meeting, I'll be bringing that calendar list to the PTAs to say, just keep these in mind that when you, when you have an event, um, it can't always be perfect, but we, if we're talking about wanting to celebrate, especially in elementary, if we did it a different night and we could ensure that everybody could go if they wanted to, um, that's just something we have to continue to strive for. And then seek, organize, and allocate resources towards achieving these commitments. And I think about the conversation we just had earlier. So busing for summer camp, that, that if, if we're focused on that, then how are we utilizing and allocating our resources to make sure that we're standing behind our commitment to every single student and making sure they have an equitable, equitable opportunity when they come to school. Um, I get to present this, but I can't thank enough the entire um, senior cabinet team, especially Dr. Potter, um, who really worked over the last two years. But this was when we go through that list of the number of people who had eyes on, looked at, feedback, it really changed a lot. And so I just wanted to say thank you, because at the end of the day, we are here for every single kid, not just the ones we happen to put on a school bus at our own home, but every single student that comes into Penfield. And so questions on, on either that? Board members, questions, comments? I have a comment. Go ahead. So I would just like to say, first of all, thank you for all the work you've done on this. And two things I think continue to stand out to me is all, when we say all students, we mean all students. But also in your slideshow, Dr. Putnam, you had said where we keep learning and evolving. Yeah. I think it's really important for all of us to recognize like our lens and our perspective shifts. I think as board members, like we're a board of seven, we all bring a different perspective and I think that's what makes us a strong unit and being, and even my lens as a parent, like, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't know my husband and I didn't have biracial children. So my perspective even has evolved and changed. I think it's really important that we, when we're looking at this, it, it's not done. It's something we're gonna, going to continue to look at, but I think it's also important for our stakeholders to know, like my perspective is going to be different than Catherine's perspective, whose is going to be different than Mark's perspective, because we're all bringing something different, but the same is true of our kids and our families. And I just think that's really important that we always are um, reminded of that, but know that all of our students are part of our fabric and we need to make sure we're including all of them. Great. Thank That's you. it. Sorry. Anyone else? Go ahead. I have a quick. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah. This will be quick too, I think. Yeah. Um, just a comment. I was, because uh, I was thinking about the whole issue of being equitable, um, just as a family, as we've gotten information about the SAT prep classes and mm. SATs and all that stuff. And you know, when I was going to school there was no free SAT prep class. Mm -hmm. And really it became down to, even back in the day, mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't say how long, even back then it was expensive. So it really became something that only affluent families did. And so I think sometimes, I think sometimes some might think that being equitable is, okay, everybody just gets a 1600 on the SAT so that nobody feels bad. And that's not, being equitable, it's it's everybody being able to take, it's money not being a determining factor about whether you could take a prep course. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you still have to work really hard and, and, um, and do really well. And the teachers still need to teach the math and the English and everything else so that kids will do well. But it's the, it's the prep class being free that's the equitable part. 
Um, and I don't know a parent who doesn't appreciate, who really wants to spend $1,000 on an SAT course. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know one. <laughs> so uh, I'm grateful for that. And that's just one. And, and then the SAT, one more thing about the SAT, the fact that colleges, more and more colleges are making it um, optional mm -hmm. so that colleges are recognizing that there's a lot of really smart people who aren't good test takers. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we want good test takers, but we don't just want good test takers. Right. We want all different iterations of intelligence. So, um, so that's another piece of being equitable is it's not just good test takers who are smart. Right. Um, yeah. So I just, I want to um, peek sort of a thought, which is our, when we talk about tests, when we hit high school, they are required for the most part. You've got to take the Regents exam. Mm -hmm. um, our three through eight New York State testing, which is required through ESSA that we have to provide, is, is not required. Students can opt out of it. And that really was a driving factor a few years back, a big push for, for some to, to opt out. And we've al always honored that. But then when that data is used to see where students fall in the district, it's not really accurate data because if you have 100 students opt out at a grade level who may have earned a five on that test, you know, or four on that exam, it sort of, it, it throws off that data. Mm -hmm. But I'm not gonna be a district that says, you have to take that assessment. We're not gonna allow a family to opt out because they know their kids better than we ever will. Mm -hmm. But those are the pieces with those, those data points I think are really important that, that there's always sort of a story behind them. Mm -hmm. My quick question. Yes. Um, can you share with us why we chose uh, a five-year plan? It was um, really because that's like what my car payments are based off of. <laughs> I'll turn to Dr. Potter on that. Dr. Potter, was there a, a reason for that? We wanted to have a, a, an entry point. And we also realized that we won't be done in five years. Like this work will be ever evolving. I've heard that word used a couple of times this evening. And it is an opportunity for us to get started. So over the next five years, we look to um, work as a district to achieve all of the collective commitments that we have put in place for ourselves. However, when we get to year 2028, it's an opportunity for us to be reflective, talk about where we've been, um, assess the progress that we've made, but more importantly, start to plan and think forward about all of the things that we know that we need to continue doing. So although we referenced five years, we know that it will be long be beyond those five years that we'll continue <coughs> this work. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, I mean, every car company now does like 84 months to pay for your car. So my wife does not allow that. So. All right. Anyone else? So I just have a comment, you know, when we talk about all of these, all of the committees that were in place, I think it's important to acknowledge that students were able to partake in that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the decisions that are being made, students are also being the decision makers. And how empowering is that, you know, that students have that opportunity to be involved in the work because they're the ones that are living it. Mm -hmm. um, I know my daughter, I talk about her a lot, um, my nine-year-old just came home. She's so excited because elementary is now having a shared decision-making committee. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's great because we're building leaders, yeah. you know, and they're, again, it's about them, you know, and that's why we're all here and to include them and that they're able to see that their voice matters. Mm -hmm. That's so important. So thank you for all the work that you've done, but also creating oppor more opportunities for students to be involved. Mm -hmm. All right. Just a little bit, I'm gonna shift gears and just, uh, this is early, the board's aware, um, but we wanna talk a little bit about some district owned property at 3021 Atlantic Avenue. And so just for the community, the district has owned and still owns property on Gloria Drive and Atlantic Avenue. And so we've had those um, in, in the district ownership for, for decades. Um, the district is currently exploring the possibility of selling the property it owns at 3021 Atlantic Avenue. 
the households directly impacted, so that would be the homes that are, are next to and around that property, um, did receive written communication from my office um, and with phone numbers to Dr. Driffel and myself. And so we fielded a, a few calls of people just asking sort of what the process is and if we could keep them in the loop. The letter basically just says what I'm saying here is we're starting as a district and a board to look at that. Um, and then we'll, the district will share more information once a, a final decision has been made. Um, just a little bit about that land, there was maybe about five, six years ago, the district actually looked at building our buildings and grounds facility. And that's when we could not find land to build a transportation site. And um, you know, over time we realized that that wasn't gonna work, but back then, five, six years ago, we met with all those neighbors. We had a meeting in person and talked through the potential uh, use of that. Um, now we're building out on uh, Jackson and Plank. So as we've continued to study that property, we don't see as a district any feasible use for it in the future. Um, and so <clears throat> just want it to be upfront, transparent, share it with the community now, more to come as we continue to look at it and work with the Board of Education on final outcome, but also wanted to make sure because those community members have received a letter, they're aware of it. It's not you know, secret information, but we wanted them to hear it before I ever said anything at a board meeting or, or it got out. We, th they'd be the most impacted. Um, so more to come for that. I have a question slide in there, but any questions? No. All right. So this is really exciting. I won't completely nerd out. Maybe two years ago, Catherine and I attended an event um, for uh, information exchange, and we both came here and got super eclipse nerdy about how exciting it is. <laughs> but it's coming. It's this school year. It's April 8th. We share these slides with staff. Many staff members shared them with students to try to get the excitement. Um, we are, Rochester's right there in the middle, we are in the, the main path of this um, solar eclipse that's gonna take place on Monday, April 8th. Our calendar this year for school, we extended our um, April break to mo include Monday the 8th. Every district in the county did that. Brighton has a half day, um, but they also, they also get a lot of days off um, for uh, different holidays. Um, and so <clears throat> we're, we're really excited about this. Um, it begins at 207. You got plenty of time to plan. Um, it lasts about three minutes and 38 seconds. Um, the previous solar total solar eclipse in Rochester was back January 24th, 1925. It was amazing. You should see the pictures I took. The <laughs> next total solar eclipse in Rochester is October 26, 2144. I will not be there for that one. Nobody will. Um, so it really is exciting. And um, we have uh, uh, no school that day. We have already purchased Eclipse glasses for um, all of our students. Talk about being fiscally responsible. We bought those shortly after I went to that event two years ago. So then now they've jacked up all the prices mm -hmm. and we are sitting pretty. Um, and then the high school created an Eclipse Club this year. And so that's Shane Watterson right there, our incredible TOSA for STEAM. She is all about this. She actually is a public school rep for the county um, on the uh, uh, Museum and Science Center Eclipse Committee. And uh, the director of the Science Museum is a Penfield resident. And Shane is there. I got invited and I, I said, you can do it, Shane. So she's incredible. She's standing in front right there of these ginormous, real working eclipse glasses that two people can stand behind. Mm -hmm. We had all of this fun stuff for opening day to really kick off the excitement. And even if you're not a solar nerd and you're like, this is no big deal, what we keep hearing is the media will blow this up when it gets closer. And so you'll hear things like, it is a once in a lifetime. You want to be with your family when it happens. You want to be able to say, where were you? And so we know that, that that will also drive people wanting to take a look at it. So all the hotels in Penfield, there's two, are um, <laughs> sold out on April 8th. You can't get a room. People come from all over to see it. And then really this was Monroe County and State Department of Transportation working with us to say we want all buses off the road. Um, there are some amazing things, but when it happens, there can be a lot of traffic of people who came in for the event leaving right when it's over. And that would be when our elementary buses are on the road. So um, just wanted to share some exciting stuff. And that concludes superintendent reports.
board members questions or comments Catherine um, there is nothing nerdy about getting excited about a total eclipse I should in case you don't know me <laughs> the word nerd in my household in my life is like the best compliment in the world all right then all right I'll take if it. you do not know yet that <laughs> nerds rule the world in yep. terms of all of those billionaires and company owners they're all really super smart and uh, and that's the stuff so but All of our is, kids in school who nerd out over this are probably going to be amazing leaders down there. Yeah, for sure. And this is so exciting, uh, you know, these natural phenomena yeah. and whatnot, these once-in-a-lifetime events. And, uh, you know, right, I was going to say in our backyard, but right overhead. Yeah. You know, it's right there. It's very, very cool. Yeah. It's awesome. So thank Unless you. Unless you're Joe Burrow, who, you know, just... Well, you probably don't know. Well, never mind. <laughs> he might not get excited about it, but the rest of us will. That's awesome. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. That concludes. That concludes Superintendent Report. Okay, gotcha. yeah. okay. <laughs> so we have no public comment tonight, so we'll go to 7A, approval of Elevate Contract. Can I please have a motion and second that the Board of Education hereby approves the agreement with Elevate for the provision of athletic strength and conditioning services during the 2023-2024 school year and authorizes the superintendent of schools to execute the approved version of the agreement from legal counsel on behalf of the Board of Education. So moved. Second. Board members, questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. We are on President's remarks. So we have two um, Monroe County School Board Association committee meetings. So we have legislative um, that you weren't able to attend. So we don't have any real. Yeah, legislative, I did check that it was their first meeting. So they yeah. basically just did an overview invite introductions. Um, I did go to the Information Exchange Committee. Uh, the presentation was from Pittsford Central Schools and uh, mm -hmm. Hilton yeah. Central Schools. Uh, it was around um, uh, um, instructional materials and library book policies. And it really was Hilton. If you remember last year, Hilton dealt with uh, being on the national news for bomb threats that shut down the school multiple days uh, all around a book that they had in their library. And so um, uh, Casey, their superintendent, did a nice job just going over their process and their review, but also talked about the impact it had on, on students and families in the community because of those, those bomb threats. Mm -hmm. And um, they are working still with um, FBI and uh, other law enforcement agencies to try to determine where they came from. So it was just an overview of both the books, but also in terms of um, security preparedness and planning for those events. And, um, Mr. Fox is in the audience, our, our uh, security okay. um, manager, and, and just that partnership with our local law enforcement, but not just Monroe County, also New York State Police, Brighton Police, Homeland Security, and the FBI. All of those are just important as we look at making sure that we can keep all students, staff, and community members safe. Tom, do you know why the, normally MCSBA will put that on their website? Um, I don't know. You don't know. They didn't say anything about it at the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had the um, like the information, the powerpoints that went with it. Yeah. But they didn't have the like meeting. Vi like video. Yeah. You mean? Oh yeah. You know there wasn't video there. Oh. There okay. wasn't a camera. So, okay. So All right. So I'm not sure. All right. That's fine. Normally they do it. So. Um, I'll find out. Yeah. Cause I, I go I to labor relations tomorrow. So. Can you find I'll out find for out. me. Uh -huh. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Uh -huh. All right, no unfinished business, any new business? All right, so can I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 8.19 p.m.? So moved. Second. second. <laughs> we both Any second. questions or comments? <laughs> nope. All right, all those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. 